it is our great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the Salon Mind, Body and Soul. And what a turnout we have. Look at this room. We typically uh, cap our ticket sales at 200. And we had such a long waiting list that we decided to extend it to 250. When we got to 250, we had still such a long waiting list that we extended it again. And we now have 322 visionary women in the room tonight. <laughs> So clearly the subject of wellness has resonated with a lot of people and before we start the program we're going to really discuss mind, body and soul. I'd like to ask each of you to turn to your neighbour and just take a quick 30 seconds, don't be shy, and let her know what it is that connection is for you and how do you nurture it and you'll see how that is connected to the program tonight so just take a few seconds and do it say hello So, what you just experienced, you will experience a little later on in the program. But first of all, I'd like to introduce our executive committee and our founders, Angela Nazarian, who we love, Veronica Grazer, The Honourable Nicole Levant, who's sitting in the back. Thea Andrews. And the Mayor of Beverly Hills, Lily Bossy. Now, we can't let a moment like this go by, Lily, without telling you how very, very proud we are of you and what a visionary you are and what a visionary woman you are. And apropos of our program tonight, it's my understanding that Lily has a wellness initiative in store for the city of Beverly Hills. So how lucky is the city of Beverly Hills to have you? We love you. We'd also like to take a moment and welcome our Visionary Circle members. And just so you know, in the past couple of months, we have had this incredible increase in Visionary Circle membership. And these are women who make an annual pledge to support Visionary Women. And they also serve as ambassadors for Visionary Women. And they really are emblematic of what our mission statement is. And we have developed these five points of what Visionary Women is really all about, and it's on the back of your program, and of course it's on our website. But I'd like to just quickly tell you, first of all, Visionary Women is a nonprofit organization. We are lean, and we are dedicated to making sure that the maximum amount of money raised goes to the initiatives and organizations that we support. That's 90% of all the money raised. And thematically, what you're going to find about Visionary Women is that we're about empowering and emboldening women. And apropos to that, you will notice that we have an entire mentoring program, and we always make a point in each salon to have a group of young students join us. And tonight, I'm very pleased to tell you that in the audience, we have a collective group of 45 young ladies from Cal State University Northridge and USC. And I would like, could the young, could everyone please stand up? We have these wonderful, great young students and they're just so inspiring. 
Now I'd like to invite to the stage a young lady who is a junior at Cal State University Northridge. She is an honors business and accounting student. We're delighted to have her here. Her name is Liz Ayers. Hello, my name is Liz Ayers and I am an accounting and business honors junior at California State University Northridge. <laughs> And I am part of a wonderful group of students who are all very driven, who are here today, and we very much appreciate the opportunity. Um, the spirit of visionary women is so simple, yet it is uncommon. It is just general kindness. It is your efforts that embark change, and it is your actions that embody the success and leadership we all aspire to achieve. I know for myself, as a mom with a prior career in social services and a new career in business, it's very important for me, and I know for all of us, to carry forward our greater purpose outside of ourselves in our work. And it's your mentorship here today, your presence, that allows us to move forward and achieve those goals. Thank you. Well, that, that tells the story, doesn't it? Uh, we'd also like to take this time to thank all of the volunteers who've worked so hard. This really does take a village, and we have a group of dedicated young ladies, Nicole, Heidi, Holly, Tatiana, Tiffany, uh, who am I missing here? I apologize. Uh, Danielle, Sarah, and Alexandra. We want to say thank you very much. You girls worked really hard for us. Now, what I would like to do is tell you something that's so exciting for us. We are announcing our partnership with the Wall Street Journal. And Visionary Women was approached by the Wall Street Journal, and we, they are our exclusive media partner. And not only do, is, are we over the moon about that, but it speaks volumes for what we are all doing here collectively. So we want to share this with you. You'll see the Wall Street Journal trademark uh, on, on all of our uh, materials going forward. And what's most interesting is that Wall Street Journal is so synchronistic with visionary women because they have been supporting a variety of women's issues ranging from everything from pay equity, parental leave, balanced work life, uh, daycare in the workplace, diversity, uh, gender equality, all of these issues that we all share in common. And I don't think a moment can go by at this point in time in our history that we all appreciate how important it is to have a truthful and solid voice in the media. So thank you very much to the Wall Street Journal. We are very honored and we're very proud. You will have at your seats a uh, a copy of the Wall Street Journal magazine, as well as a complimentary three-month uh, free subscription to the Wall Street Journal, and we encourage you to take advantage of their generosity. And we're very proud of ourselves, so thank you again. <laughs> and, and the next thing we I want to uh, point out for everyone is that every salon has a sponsor, and this salon has been sponsored by Geary's of Beverly Hills. And everyone knows that Geary's is a legend in Beverly Hills of quality and of luxury since 1930. And this is the second salon that Geary's has supported visionary women, and we're very grateful to them. We would like to extend our gratitude and say how thankful we are for their ongoing support and welcome the guests from Geary's who are here this evening. So now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the newest member to our executive committee of Visionary Women, and that is Thea Andrews. Now, just a little bit you need to know about Thea, and the rest will be on display because she is an excellent moderator, and she's going to be moderating the panel tonight. 
Thea is a veteran television journalist. She is the former co-anchor of Insider, among many other major talk and variety shows. She is a devoted mother of two boys. She's the ultimate professional. She has a great heart and empathy for people who have less than her. And what she and it shows in everything she does, and she is de a dedicated activist to women, to issues particular to women. We are delighted to have you, Thea, on our executive team. You have jumped in with your sl sleeves rolled up and been a great energy and a great addition. So welcome and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Thea Andrews. I have to thank you for that kind and wonderful introduction. And you have all made me feel so welcome on this committee. And it is, a, it is an honor to, to be working with you ladies. I also want to reiterate Shelley's gratitude for our sponsor, Geary's, my, one of my favorite stores in Beverly Hills, by the way. And also our gratitude to all of you for coming tonight because you know, when we talk about this all the time, we do, we do not take it for granted that you take time you, out of this day to come here for an hour to have a conversation with us, to share with us, to have communication and hopefully a connection with this amazing group of women that is growing in visionary women. So um, thank you. That is not something that we take for granted. So the idea for this salon, mind, body and soul, it started with a conversation that we had about women's health about issues surrounding women's health. And we got to this question, that, that basic question, well, what, what is wellness? What, what does that even really mean when we say we, want, we all want wellness, but what is it? And we started thinking about how there's a connection between wellness and these, this trinity of things, of mind and body and soul, and, and how if those three things are connected, ultimately it affects that sense of well-being and our emotional self and our spiritual self and ultimately our happiness. So we thought about how interesting it is that here in America, we live in the first world where we have an extraordinary amount of access to doctors, medicine, nutrition, uh, information about health, uh, education. And yet so many of us live in a place where we don't feel like we're achieving that wellness. Why is that? So we wanted to have a conversation today about the path to connecting the internal and the external. What is it that's possibly missing? What is that connection between mind, body, and soul that could be missing, and how can we bring them together? Now, we're going to share ideas today with some extraordinary panelists. We have a dream team tonight, and I want to tell you that for those of you who have come to our panels before, you know that we have been fortunate. We've been blessed to have truly extraordinary panelists. And uh, once again, we are continuing our hot streak tonight. So I'm going to introduce them and bring them all up to the stage, uh, starting with Ms. Kimberly Snyder. Would you come up? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to have you sit over okay. here. Now, Kimberly is a nutritionist. She's a wellness expert, a New York Times bestselling author of many books, including The Beauty Detox Solution and most recently, Radical Beauty, which she co authored with Malika's dad, who you're about to meet, Malika Chopra, her father, Deep Deepak Chopra. So, already we're making the connections here, which I love. She's the creator of BioGlow, which is a smoothie juice and cleanse company. She's the go to nutritionist for many of the entertainment industry's uh, top celebrities. Do a little, Nate, can I do a little name dropping? Is that okay? Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> Carrie Washington, Drew Barrymore, whole bunch of, uh, and, and more. You've seen her talking about nutrition and wellness on the Today Show. Dr. Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, uh, another entertainment show that I wasn't on, so I won't name it. <laughs> uh, and you've seen her write in publications like Vogue, The New York Times. Uh, she was named by Vogue as the top results-oriented nutritionist, which I love. <laughs> High praise coming from Vogue magazine. And when you go to her website, the very first thing it says on her website is, my goal is to help you live your healthiest, most awesome and beautiful life. And frankly, I love that goal. I can't wait to talk more about that tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Our next panelist is Malika Chopra. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Now, Malika, as you all know, is a media entrepreneur, a public speaker. Her books have been translated and sold in dozens of countries around the world. Her most recent, Living with Intent, My Somewhat Messy Journey to Purpose, Peace, and Joy. Malika, I'm trying to read in Spanish, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you haven't read her books yet, you have maybe still read some of her writings in Self Magazine, Women's Health, Prevention, own, Glamour, Oprah.com, HuffPost. I mean, I could be here all night, but I'm gonna. Um, she's also the founder of Intent.com, which is a website and an app that focuses on personal, social, and global wellness. So really playing into the topic and the theme that we're talking about tonight. She's spoken passionately at conferences and festivals uh, all around the world, TEDx, Idea City. Um, the Parliament of World Religions, and she's also a popular speaker for companies like Coca-Cola, LinkedIn, Google, maybe you've heard of them. Um, she's taught meditations to thousands of people, and we are very fortunate today because if I uh, can keep my big mouth shut and sort of move this along fast enough, hopefully at the, at the end we will have enough time to have her lead us in a guided meditation, which I'm very excited about. Um, I also want to add that uh, she has a BA from Brown University, an MBA from Kellogg School of Business, and right now she is at Columbia doing her master's in psychology in mind, body, and spirit. So if you like what you hear tonight and you're interested in learning more, just so you know, you can actually go to Columbia and get a master's in it. If you can get into Columbia to do a master's, I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can, but the, the smarty pants in the audience will be able to do that. So thank you so much for being here, Malika. Okay, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Samantha Page. Um, Samantha Page is an artist. She's a mother, she's a, a writer, and a person that has a true passion for truth and connection. When she was in her early 20s, she survived thyroid cancer, and years later she tested positive for the BRCA1 gene, and she opted for preventative surgery. After six major surgeries, and some, as she says, some lovely scars to show for it, she's here to share a little bit about that journey with us and how that journey led to now, to a place where she's happy to feel stronger and healthier than ever. It was a, a, a long and hard journey, and she learned a lot of lessons on the way that I think that you guys are gonna be really amazed to hear. Now, in January 2016, she launched something called Last Cut. It started as a photo documentary project that grew into a blog, that grew into a podcast, that grew into a book, that will uh, no doubt grow into many more things, much more to come. Last Cut began when she opted for what she calls an explant. She opted to remove the silicone implant that they had put in doing um, after they had done her reconstruction, after she opted to have a, a double mastectomy in 2008. And the amazing work of Last Cut was actually brought to our attention at Visionary Women uh, through an Equinox campaign, which I'm sure many of you in the audience saw. It was the, the 2017 Equinox campaign, Commit to Something. Now, it was a gorgeously photographed ad campaign um, by, it was Stephen Klein, right, the photographer? Uh, she seen widely in print on billboards. There was a billboard on Sunset Avenue. I'm sure that was a, a Sunset Boulevard. I'm sure that was a <laughs> surreal experience. And in addition to being in the, in the ad, she also spoke her truth and talked about her scars in both the, a commercial for the company and um, the, the brand social media all around the world. And it, it really brought attention to her incredible Project Last Cut that she's gonna be talking to today. So uh, thank all of you ladies for being here today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been saying, uh, as I spoke to these three women uh, leading in the weeks up to the salon, how extraordinary it was that even though they have such, they come from, they have such different practices and they do such different work, so many of the ideas and the things that they work on interconnect and I, uh, 
overlap and connect. And I think you'll see tonight that there are a lot of connections between what they do. So I sort of gave the formal introduction, the, the formal bio, but I'd love to take a minute just to hear the three of you explain a little bit in your own words about your work, what drives you, and what you're passionate about. So um, the women here can get to know you a little bit better. So I'm gonna volunteer okay. you to start. Okay, I'm <laughs> first up in the row. Uh, Hi, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Thea, and thank you, Lily, for inviting me in the, in the committee, the Visionary Committee. This is really exciting. Uh, my name is Samantha Page. I grew up here in Beverly Hills. And I think the, the, the beautiful thing about what I'm doing now and what has come through with Last Cut is this, the incredible power that we each have to make decisions to, as you said in your opening, bring our, our internal world and our external worlds in line. And Last Cut is not just about boobs or a lack of, or even the specifics of the decision that I made, but in, in making that decision to have the silicone implants removed, it, it was the opportunity to talk about these moments that we all have really every day in varying scales of, looking at things in our life that may be out of alignment with who we truly are and having the courage and building the community and getting the support and focusing on where we want to go, making those decisions and then coming in line with a life where we feel healthy and well and connected to the real reason that we're here and what we have to bring into the world. So I'm passionate about the truth, and I'm passionate about living the things that matter most to me. And that has, has been what this year and a half now has been about for me, is having a really deep and truthful conversation about getting clear on who you are and then having the courage to act on behalf of it. So I've been telling my story, and then also through the podcast, speaking with other people about big decisions that they've made that have had, you know, run the gamut of what they are because we're all faced with these moments where we have the opportunity to, to make our lives better by, by taking action. When you talk about becoming clear about mm -hmm. who you are, a lot of it is es establishing intent. And that is, as I said, there's gonna be a lot of crossover tonight, mm -hmm. really the core of your work, Malika. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, so um, again, truly an honor to be here. Um, always want to thank Angela Nazarian, um, who's become a good, good friend, um, and Lily as well, um, who is doing an initiative here in Beverly Hills with my father, Deepak Chopra. So I grew up, obviously, uh, in a family where I learned how to meditate when I was nine. My brother and I were the guinea pigs for all of my dad's experiments. So, um, you know, we've tried a lot of things. Uh, and my, the subtitle of my book, Living with Intent, is called My Somewhat Messy Journey to Purpose, Peace, and Joy. And the messy is a very important part of that. So, you know, when I hear the bio, it sounds like it's not really me, because for me, I'm always just trying to figure out what I'm doing next. Frankly, that's why I went back to school again now <laughs> as well. Um, but when we grew up, uh, after our meditations, my father would have my brother and I repeat a phrase, and it goes like this. It says, I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and set the goals I will achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. And he'd ask us as kids, what do you ask for? And we would ask for things like, um, we grew up in Boston, so tickets to the Patriots and the Celtics, a trip to Hawaii, new clothes, um, and we'd have many things to ask for. And he'd listen patiently, and then he'd say, OK, OK, um, but what about asking for love, connection, inspiration, a sense of purpose? And so we were taught on a daily basis to ask for our intentions. And intents are very different from goals. Intents come from the soul, from that deep place inside of us. When we're quiet, when we connect to ourselves, and we really ask ourselves, who am I? Where do I come from? How can I serve? Um, and those were the qualities that we kind of were taught growing up. 
That being said, <laughs> as I said, I've had this very messy journey and this, I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Um, you know, I started in the entertainment industry and um, I went to business school because at that point I just wanted my husband to move back to the States. We were living in India and it was an easy way to get back here. Um, and so I feel like I'm always kind of reconnecting and asking myself questions to figure out what is the next step and action. And so we'll talk a lot, um, I think, about balance, because yes. a few years yes. ago, I found that despite growing up like this, I was a complete mess, totally out of balance. Um, and I had to redefine that for myself. Um, and I will just say Kimberly um, is such a great resource okay. and friend <laughs> um, in terms of uh, understanding some of that knowledge. We spoke before, and, and you were talking about your m messy life and how she said it was so funny. She said, yeah, I just want to be authentic with people and because I think it won't make them feel better to know that if Deepak Chopra's daughter can't find balance, then it's OK if we all can't find balance. And I thought, gosh, that's so good to know. Uh, and speaking of intention, and you two know each other, right? You've yes. yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know Samantha as well. Yeah. yeah. All, and all, we three, all, together all three of you were together. Yeah. Yes. Different speaking capacities. speaking yeah. of intent, and we spoke a little bit about your intent, too. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit can about you, your intent? Can you guys hear me? So yeah. I've, I've got. Um, I haven't been very regular with my haircut since my son was born. <laughs> Speaking about messy lies. She has a one-year-old, by the yes. way. Mm -hmm. Little mm -hmm. angel. So thank you guys so much for being here. It's such an incredible honor to be part of this event and to be with all you beautiful, amazing women and to be up here with Thea and Samantha and Malika. And you know, as Malika was saying, when you hear your bio, it sounds it doesn't always sound like <laughs> you. It's nice to hear the highlights of your career you know, punctuated in a bio. But I just wanted to take a moment to uh, share with you guys a little bit about my journey and my story, which you don't hear in the bio, right? You don't hear really what's going on with someone. So I grew up in a um, pretty much 100% uh, Caucasian town in Connecticut. And because I'm ethnically diverse, I really stood out. And growing up, everyone would ask me questions. What are you? You know, like, oh, you know, I'm a human being. Or, you know, what are you? <laughs> oh, you mean my, you know, where my parents are from or whatever. So I grew up feeling always you know, alien. And I grew up with a lot of um, self-hatred and very low self-esteem and never feeling like I was good enough, which I know that all of us have on some level inside of us. We all have those feelings of not feeling good enough. And that segued into um, having a very unhealthy relationship with food and eating disorders and gaining a lot of weight and looking to food for comfort. And as a result, eating, eating very unhealthily, having a very bad acne. And you know, we talk about today the mind-body-soul connection. So it wasn't just physical. I, couldn't look people in the eye. I had to look down. I didn't believe in myself in many ways. So through that journey, I, um, I tried every diet. I had very low energy. I was in a very, um, I was in a job that I, I despised. I was going to be a doctor, and then I veered off that path. I was in a bad relationship. And I happened to be in Australia. My first job after college was in Australia. And somehow I intersected with this nutritionist. You know, and I went in, I was like, well, maybe she's going to actually help me lose all this weight. And I went in, and she said, so tell me about your digestion. And I said, I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Tell me the good stuff. Tell me how to lose the weight, finally. And she said, you know, it's actually all connected. And so it actually put me on the path of looking at things from a much more holistic perspective. And I was able to get out of this prison of numbers where I was obsessed with calories, and obsessed with tracking everything, and I never had good results. And so it freed up all this energy. Um, my, my energy went up. My acne cleared up. And I ended up traveling. I was going to travel for a few weeks. I ended up backpacking for three years around the world mostly in Asia and Africa, and I had so many dozens of formal and informal teachers. It changed the way that I looked at wellness permanently. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, you know, it just came from my own journey. I just started a website, a blog, when I was going back to nutrition school and, and teaching some yoga in New York, and it just organically grew. You know, Malika talks about intention. I was writing almost to heal myself if that makes sense. And I was talking to myself, but I was also, it was just pouring forth. And you know, it just grew organically. Um, 
magazine started finding it, and then I got on Good Morning America, and without trying to be a celebrity nutritionist, I started working with some that read my blog, and the, you know, the books came, and everything happened from that passion. But I just want you guys to know that it comes from turning darkness and struggle into growth and self-growth. And when we, we can all do that, and we can all really grow together and help each other and inspire each other. So again, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. And um, you know, no matter how nice and pretty vials mm -hmm. look like, it doesn't, it's not really the full picture of what's going on. And I'm grateful for the journey. I'm really grateful. So thank you guys. Kimberly, as I was saying earlier, when you go to your website, you have your intent. The first thing you read on your website is your intent. I think it was my, to live your healthiest, most, most awesome, beautiful life. You talk about beauty a lot. Yes. But I want to ask you how you define beauty, because it might be different than you know some of the plastic surgeons that are up there. <laughs> right? When you're talking yes, about beauty, you. what are you talking about? I think it's so important that we talk about beauty being together here as women, because beauty is a source of enormous struggle for most all of us. Um, beauty is a very touchy word. You know, we go into the aisles of CVS and there's whole aisles, there's whole magazines. Everything is about beauty. But it's defined in our culture in a way that is very limited. It makes us feel a sense of lack. It's you know about certain defined idealistic features or being a certain you know, again, the numbers, being a certain age or certain weight or these really reductionist ways of looking at ourselves. Um, so beauty is actually in the title of three of my books. I define beauty as reaching your highest potential, being your healthiest, most vibrant, most authentic self, because there's only one of you in the entire world. And so when you are yourself, that is when you are the most beautiful. And you can support that energy with great nutrition, great sleep, meditation, all these different aspects. But when we look at beauty as, oh, it has to look like this, then we're caught in this you know, duality of seeing this and trying to be it and emulate it and spend all this energy trying to be something that we're not. And then this is never ending struggle where we're never fulfilled because we're not really being ourselves. So to me, Beauty is authenticity, owning who you are and celebrating that and realizing you really are your most beautiful just being you. And so that is, again, as Malika talks about intent, that's really my intention to put out into the world after being so lost myself and not being, being so disconnected from who I was and my authenticity and thinking I was so, you know, I wasn't good enough for so long, hating myself, hating how I looked, just being so disconnected. It's coming back to that and the joy in the mind, body, soul, it, it carries into everything that we do, our relationships, our everything. And you, again, I just have to say, if you look into a forest, there's palm, you know, maybe not palm trees, but they're <laughs> California, but there's fir trees and there's willow trees, there's different types of trees and they're all beautiful in their own way. <laughs> so instead of this sort of homogenous, way that media and imagery and social media can make us look at beauty. Right. We celebrate that uniqueness that we all have. I think that's really beauty. one of the most beautiful, beautiful definitions of beauty. One of the, the most definition. meaningful <laughs> definitions. No, but it is. I think you know, this, the, the ideas that we have in our head about beauty are things that lead us to do, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room has probably done something in their life, whether it's, you know, get your hair dyed when you're pregnant or done something that you did for beauty that you thought, actually, this maybe isn't necessarily good for my, my health or my wellness, you know? Maybe it's a, the tiniest thing and maybe it's a big thing. And I think that as we, um, I think there's a little bit of a romantic, like a romanticized view of, of that we're expanding our notions of beauty, that we're accepting more things of a broader notion of what beauty is. And yet at the same time, I think as a society, we, women are doing more and more and more and more to conform to beauty mm -hmm. standards. We're doing more stuff. And um, I thought about that a lot when I was reading your story, Samith, because you, you talk about um, why you decide, the reasons that you decided to, to have reconstructive surgery after you right. had your elective mastectomy. Um, that was a big choice, not a little choice. 
um, and ultimately a choice that led you down the path to last cut. And uh, I would love you to explain why that was a watershed moment for you. Maybe the reasons why you made that, why the ideas in, in your head, I know and part of it had to do with conforming to the way you thought people thought you should look. Right. When I elected to actually have the implants when I had the when preventive you put them double mastectomy. Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, yes, we almost jumped up once. Um, we always think yeah. about beauty like that. No, exactly. And that's just been so much about what the last year has been about for me. But certainly in the moment where I had, a, I think, a seven month old when I elected to have my preventive double mastectomy. And I remember the options being presented as, do you want this implant or this implant? And there was this whisper you know, that we were talking about earlier when I, we did our one-on-one -on -one interview, how we hear these whispers in the body, mm -hmm. and or there's just like this feeling of, oh, I'm not sure, maybe there's something more, you have a question. I think sometimes we don't always have the courage to stand up on behalf of ourselves to ask more questions and to get more information. And so in that moment, I was a new mom, which you can speak to what that's yes. like, you know, in year one, where you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to sleep and eat and feed another human, and, and just, you know, as beautiful as it is, you, you, there's, there's something else that you're, someone else that you're focusing on. And I, I asked, well, couldn't I use my own body fat? But the doctor was like, no, that, that in your case won't work. And so those were the two options presented. And it wasn't presented to not do anything. Mm -hmm. And and that's interesting, but it was not presented to not do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Which from wow. what, especially, yeah, this last year of now being very much in this community of, of women, um, who have had either double mastectomies because of breast cancer or preventively and, and, and for whatever reason, um, that seems to be a common thread that, that I've heard over and over again with, with a lot of women that the, the options aren't presented with equal uh, or with a lack of bias, I guess, with, with each of them. So like it would never be a consideration that you as a woman are, could go out in this world and live a happy and fulfilled life without having boots. Right, right. Like that's not but I think a that's, possible. Exactly. And I think that speaks to obviously gender bias and identity bias in, in general of what makes other people comfortable and what other people think is normal. And so we have this definition of a woman should have breasts and a woman should often dress a certain way because that's beautiful for a woman. And so in that moment, I think I was told that these are what make most women happy and that most men feel as if these feel more normal and that I, I wasn't in a place in my life where I was asking questions on behalf of my own well-being. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted what seemed normal and what would make me feel whole. I mean, I just had this huge thing happen to me where regardless of choosing, I, I, I was completely behind this decision to have this double mastectomy, having already had thyroid cancer and given the consciousness and what I knew about wellness at that point in my life, I was ec excited and felt empowered by the decision, but still it was an enormous decision, and especially with a small child. Mm -hmm. So I elected to have that, but then completely disconnected from that part of my body. I, on, on paper, and you know, if you go uh, to check out Last Cut, my dear friend Lisa Fields, whose hair is taken, we've taken pictures of before and after, and on paper, I looked the way that most women you know, want to look. Beautiful. I didn't need to wear a bra. I had these huge breasts that were never going to drop. But, <laughs> um, and that, I think, was actually sold as one of the perks. You'll never have to wear a bra. Literally. Well, OK. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but I, I, I checked out mm -hmm. from, from that part of my body. And I then went through nearly a decade not feeling whole, not feeling beautiful, not feeling. Um, and didn't, didn't even realize how unbeautiful and disconnected I felt in so many ways. And so, you know, what then led to the removal of the implants, I came down with a horrible MRSA staph infection that I couldn't shake. And so for seven months, I was on antibiotics. I was holistically, I changed my diet 
I had, was doing everything that I knew how to do, but I still felt really awful. And a dear friend of mine came over. She had been unwell, too. And she said, I'm having my implants removed because I think that this might be causing or triggering some of my autoimmune stuff. You might want to look into this. So for me, from the physical standpoint, it was the right decision. But then all of these ways that we're speaking of beauty and wellness being a, a multi-dimensional way of, of living and being, it, it was a lightning bolt moment where I, I realized, oh, this has nothing to do with how I look. I don't, I don't feel well with these. I don't feel as if they are representing who I am. And from the moment that they've been gone, I've never felt more beautiful. I've never felt more in my body. And, <laughs> and as, as someone who's often and, and for a long time dressed in more of a tomboy way or whatever, it, it be, I, I've never felt more feminine. I've never felt more connected to just who I am as, as a woman outside of any definition. And so I think beauty is something that is so much more, so much, it's, it's so far beyond what we're told it is in, in the media and really where you, when you turn on or open your eyes or look at anything, you we're bombarded with 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 images of of how we should be and how we should look. And and we hear it even I mean it's a constant. Right. And so I think this decision and then writing about it o over this last year has given the opportunity to tap back into who I am and, and how I need to operate. And, and so sort of as we were talking about when we were taking our picture, I've sort of taken this vow that for the first hour that I'm awake, I don't turn on, I don't tune in to any of um, you know, my email or social media. Because it's like, then that's the first thing that's going in to my awareness versus me tapping into you know, what's, what's within. How many people do that? When you wake up and oh, the, first, yeah. is it the first, first, right? Yeah. First thing you do, we look at our phones. Why do we do that? Yeah. Is it hard not to do that? Some, it's, I, bet, I mean, I, it, I can't imagine resisting the temptation. If you've you know, got kids, you're. I think it took a couple of days, and my dear friend Anne, who's sitting here, one of our mentors, Brendan Burchard, he talked about that. And he said that actually you become, I don't remember the percentage, but you become so much more productive. Mm. over, I think it was seven to eight weeks, if you start doing that as a daily habit. So I would say the first day or two, yes, there's this tendency you want to go. And then it almost, I, I, it, I untrained very fast. Mm -hmm. I think that habits, informing habits, have to start, of course, with an intent to form a habit, which is the basis of, of your work. And we've been talking about it a lot tonight. But I'd love to hear from you how you actually, can you give some suggestions and advice on how to do that? You talked about becoming truthful with that. The last cut really brought you to a place where for the first time you were being truthful with yourself. So you didn't make decisions like the, the mastectomy where you said, I knew I should have said no. I knew I should have said no, but right. I said yes. And part of that was, leads back to this work with intent, with knowing what you want. So how do we do that so that we don't get too far into this place. Yeah, so it's, that. you know, intent, when you think of intent, it's a very big concept. You know, I have this mm -hmm. social media company where we just ask, what's your intent? And we realize most people have no idea. So, you know, it's just an overwhelming question. What happened to me is um, I teach meditation, I speak, and uh, about three or four years ago, I was speaking to an audience of women about meditation and health, balance, wellness, all the great things that I can talk about. And while I was giving this talk, at the back of my head, I was having a parallel conversation <laughs> where I was saying, why did I have that chocolate chip cookie and double macchiato before getting on stage? I have to go pick up the dry cleaning, get the dog food. I forgot to send the permission slip in for the field trip. I have to send that investor, like that investor note. And I realized like I was having, I was totally not being mindful and I was having this kind of double conversation. Um, and so I actually kind of stopped and realized that this was happening. And so I asked the audience to close their eyes and meditate so I could deal with my drama. <laughs> and it's a very good tip. Uh, just ask people. Multitasking, <laughs> yeah. you were balancing. 
And I remember I was on stage and I was thinking, my God, I'm such a mess and I'm such a hypocrite because you know here I am talking about all this stuff and I'm exhausted. I have no idea what I'm doing all day. I run around all day and when I try, like at the end of the day, I think about what did I do and I have no idea what I did. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy, um, but I don't even know why I'm not happy. And so that really began this journey, as I said, my somewhat messy journey. Um, and the first thing I did, and I'm bringing this up in relation to intent because I think it has to be very practical. So I ended up going home um, and, uh, you know, my kids and my uh, husband, we go and spend uh, weekends in La Jolla where my parents have a place. And it was an evening where um, my mom was cooking Indian food, my dad was on Twitter, um, <laughs> my kids were watching a movie, my husband had gone out for a run. So in my family, and we're all women here, but we have a problem we go to my mother. Nobody goes to my father. The rest of the world may go to my father, but we go to my mother. And so I thought, you know what? Let me try going to my father. I mean, he knows something about wellness. Um, and so my dad was sitting at the computer, like I said, mid-tweet. And um, I said, you know, Papa, I want to talk to you. I'm kind of stressed out. And I remember my dad was like typing and he kind of stopped and he looked at me. And then there was complete and utter panic in his eyes. <laughs> and he started to look for my mother to come and deal with me. And then I said, no, no, Papa, I'm okay. There's nothing like majorly wrong, but you know, I'm feeling like I'm out of balance and I'm stressed and I, and I don't even know why. Mm -hmm. And so what he actually, actually had some good advice. Um, he said, you know, Let's think about what balance is. And um, he took out the work of Dr. Dan Siegel, who's actually here in LA. Um, and Dr. Siegel talks a lot about the mind-body platter and neural networks and kind of the healthy brain um, synchronicities uh, for a healthy life. And so we looked at his scientific work and then we came up with something called the balance wheel. And it really began from a very practical standpoint, which is, are you sleeping well? Are you eating healthy, vibrant foods? Are you moving enough? But then we started to look at, do you have healthy relationships? Um, friends that you can connect with? Do you enjoy what you do every day? Do you feel financially secure? And then it got to the more difficult things for me. Do you get enough intellectual stimulation? You know, I was one of those people who did. I loved books and poetry and literature, but like I was so busy in my everyday life and surfing Facebook and looking at everyone else's life that I didn't have time to read anymore, or to read poetry anymore, or to feed my soul. Um, do you laugh and have fun? And I realized again, I was so busy in like my kids' world and my work and whatever, I didn't laugh or have fun anymore. Do you feel spiritually connected and like you have a sense of purpose? And so we really came up with a very practical wheel where actually it's just questions. You mark the questions from one to 10 and you really start to kind of see like once you break down the pieces of the pie, like where you're struggling. And then from there, starting to set an intent of what you can do to make a shift. Um, and so it really kind of took it like that overwhelming feeling of just being stressed um, and unhappy to kind of saying, okay, you know, so I feel like I need more intellectual stimulation. And there's another exercise that we came up with, a mind map, but one of the things that came out of that is I started bo a book club with my friends. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a book that we supposedly read every two months. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't do, because no one has time. But we have the intent to read it, we meet, we get a bottle of wine, and we sit and chat, and like, you know, we have so much fun. I'm suddenly laughing, I'm having more intellectual stimulation, and it's not like I made this huge change in my life, but that small thing has made me so much happier. Um, and so I think, again, if we can start, the, instead of being like overwhelmed by like, we have to do everything. Sometimes it's just what I call micro intents. Like maybe it's just today. Today, what do I need to feel happier, healthier, more connected, and of purpose? 
By the way, I have to thank you for that because I think that is one of the clearest explanations of balance that I've ever heard because we talk about balance all the time, right? I think particularly right, well, balance and I think especially with working women, I, oh, we're trying to find balance. I know that when I worked at CBS and I was interviewing big celebrities, you know, I'm going to interview Angelina Jolie or Nicole Kidman or whoever, well, ask her how she finds balance. Do you want to <laughs> about, like, like there was some magic formula like that they were going to, and but I never got that magic formula and that's, just about, I don't know if it's magic, but that's the idea of a wheel is yeah. probably the most helpful thing I've ever heard in, in actually quantifying that. Thank you, and I think also we talked earlier about wellness. What is wellness? Hmm. So, you know, there's personal wellness, which is, you know, our physical, emotional, mental health. But then there's social wellness, you know, our relationships with people, um, our community. Um, there's global wellness, you know, if Mother Earth is suffering, we're all going to suffer, and then they're spiritual. And so, you know, I've always seen it kind of as this personal, social, global, and spiritual. And so, but I think if we don't address the very practical personal, it's very hard sometimes to do the others. Well, let's take some time right now to do that, to, to address the practical and the personal, because when I spoke to all three of you, I was, I was really impressed by your practices. I talked to all of you about how, you know, we talk about these ideas and they're big concepts, but how do you, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis, enact those changes in your life and so that you can be healthier and that you can be healthier, uh, be happier? And all of you have a pretty specific set of practices, so I want to take a little bit of time to talk about them now. And I'm, 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 one of what you talked about, self-care. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting in one of your tenets of self-care was taking time to be unbalanced. Taking right. time for, allowing yourself time for, for uh, healing trauma, for allowing yourself time for not working all the time. Or can you, and can you talk a little bit about that? Because that is something that I don't think that a lot of people really give themselves time to do. Right. We consider that such a luxury to actually stop and right. address that in your life. Yeah, well, and I think we talked about it very much in the context of, I had a jewelry company, which is how I had met at Kimberly. We crossed paths in an, another iteration of, of my creative life and grew the jewelry company to a place where it was doing really well. I had opened a store in Santa Barbara, but I was no longer creating, and so, I felt as if it had kind of grown to this place where it was no longer connected to who, who I was. And so in the moment where that was growing and, and I decided to close it and it didn't, the decision didn't happen overnight. My friends could, my, my mom could tell you that the decision didn't happen overnight. But after that happened, I really took a good two years to focus on improving my self care taking care of my daughter, taking care of myself, and, and really creating a, a space where I was being very patient, waiting for the right thing to come in. And so I think that Why was where- Why is it where, so hard to do that? I think it's so hard to do that because we are told that we're successful based on quantifiable measures that other people can see. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True, right? I should write that one down. <laughs> you know, Talk to um, a party conversation. What are you doing now? Where, where are your right. kids going to What are you doing what right you... now? Well, what, what are you going to do next? And how does it feel that you closed your business? And oh, but it was doing so well. I mean, all of these ways that we're told were important. And it's like, oh, wait, what about taking time to tell yourself that you're important? <laughs> And, and to actually take care of yourself and so that you know where it is you actually want to be going. And that was so much of my story, all of our stories, is that it gets really messy if you're making decisions and you don't know why you're making them. Mm -hmm. It gets really ugly. You can, you know, I mean, really ugly. You can open businesses, but sometimes, you know, there are marriages, there are other decisions that we make that, that impact other people in huge ways. And I have no regrets of any of those decisions, but they can be really messy when they're the further the distance is from our heart and, and our, our soul. And so to me, that's what self-care is all about, are creating the daily practices, but the ongoing practices so that 
I'm constantly staying connected to me, and then I'm making decisions for myself that are right. And I think that's when then Last Cut was born from this place where I was really keyed in to who I was and was taking great care of myself. And then this thing popped, and it was clear. And then I asked Lisa if she wanted to take the pictures. And we established a clear you know, contract about what that was going to look like, not just contract, but how we wanted to feel through this work. And so I think you, we, we do the things to, to be healthy, but we do that so then everything that we're doing is an extension of that wellness. Kimberly, what are some of your daily practices for <clears throat> so aligning these three things? With, what I advise my readers and my clients is to really start from the morning up. And the reason I focus on the morning is because we're all so busy, as Malika said, could be the end of the day and you don't know where you are or what happened because things become chaotic. But if you start from the day, it puts you in a powerful position to be more uh, balanced, there's that word again, to be able to make better decisions. Uh, when you start from a grounded place, you're less susceptible to food cravings, to not being aware what your body really needs, to you know, going to food for comfort, or to staying in toxic relationships, or whatever it is. So I always say, you know, start from the morning up. My practice um, and my beauty detox philosophy is, first of all, which is related to what Samantha said, um, and in Radical Beauty, the book I did with Deepak, we have a whole section about uh, radiation and turning your phone in airplane mode throughout the night, which is helpful, um, but starting by not reaching for your phone. So if your phone's in airplane mode, that does help. And with my clients that are so busy, I say this becomes even more important, you know, whatever your specific meditation practice is. But starting with your feet on the ground and having time just to tune into yourself. And it seems so simple. Again, you can all different types of meditation practices, but you really need that time. And it does affect your food decisions, your emotions, your relationships, your work, everything. So that is foundational for me. And then the first, then I say, first thing in your body besides room temperature water should be hot water with lemon. Mm. On a physical level, there are specific enzymes in vitamin C and lemons that nourish your liver, which is your main detoxifying organ, a very important organ in our body. Also, the hot water grounds you. It makes you feel present in your body. But also, from an emotional and spiritual standpoint, you're doing something for yourself saying you deserve to be taken care of. So on many different levels, it's really important. And I have so many readers that don't, you know, especially that live in New York City that never go grocery shopping and don't have time, they make nothing. But I say, hey, you can go to Trader Joe's and get a bag for like five bucks and it can last you wherever, you know, everybody can buy lemons. And then, you know, you keep building. I'm a big fan of SBO probiotics, nourishing your gut. And then also starting with my signature recipe, the glowing green smoothie you guys can get the recipe on my website. It's a whole foods. It's not a juice, it's a smoothie. So we're connecting with nature. The smoothie is the fiber and the juice intact, the way that nature grew their fruits and vegetables. And one way that I was able to get out of this prison of diets and you know, calories and counting sugar and everything was to focus more on whole foods. People use that term, but they're not really honoring it. So, you know, I love juice too, and I have juice in my shop. But when you start with the smoothie and you have all that filling fiber, it starts to stabilize your blood sugar levels and your energy, and it enhances your digestion. It helps to everything. Your skin gets better. Everything gets brighter. You have more energy. So I always say, you know, none of us are perfect. We don't eat perfectly, as Malik and I talk about all the time. But if you can do some things in the morning and sort of make those your sacred practices, when everything gets crazy and you get into work or with your kids and everything goes out the window, you've started from a fantastic place. And you're less susceptible to the, you know, all the food fads, which the dietary crazes, which drive me nuts. Right, the myths, the misconceptions. Myths, I, yeah, there's, yeah, there's some really big ones out there, right? I mean, uh, just tell them quickly your one, the protein thing you have to tell I, them. Yes. You don't have a lot of time, but this sort Let of. Let me say away. quickly back to this reductionist approach. When we demonize a macronutrient. Right? I mean, there's three macronutrients, fat, carbohydrates, and protein. When we demonize one of the three, what happens is major imbalance. 
So in the 80s, it was fat, right? And it was like everything was fat free. People ended up overeating sugar, right? And refined carbohydrates. And now we're in the, we're in the midst of the demonizing of carbohydrates. And what's happened is that people go way overboard with protein. And what people don't realize, do you guys know that what happens to excess protein in your body? Besides the, you know, besides acidifying your system and putting excess pressure on your liver and your kidneys and aging you at a faster rate, the average American has three to five times too much protein. What happens to that excess protein is it converts to sugar, right? And a big study came out a couple months ago showing that excess protein is as insulinogenic in the body as white bread. I don't want to get into all the nitty gritty, but what I want to say is this idea. The end result is that, as she said to me on the phone, you're going to end up old skinny. <laughs> you know what that no, is, people, old, people old come, skinny. People come into my shop and they're like, I, I don't want banana in my protein shake, you know, because they're scared of the sugar, but I want three times more protein powder. So again, back to this idea of balance. There's no demonizing and being scared of one thing. We need the right form of, of the macronutrients of looking at nutrition more holistically. It becomes a lot simpler. We don't have to obsess. We get full from fiber without eating tiny. I mean, I had years of starvation diets and I would lose weight and then I would gain weight and I was, my energy was so low and my skin was horrible and my hair wouldn't grow. So it doesn't have to be that hard. You know, it can be a lot simpler and it drives me nuts because I see so many women struggling and eating tiny portion sizes. So it's not that we don't need protein. Of course we need protein, but we don't demonize one thing. It's, it's balance. You know, one thing I want to entreat all you ladies, if they're, if with everything that we're talking about tonight, and honestly, these are conversations that we could have for hours and days, but with, with all these three ladies, if you go to their websites, if you read their books, and, and you, you both have several books, your book is, you have several okay. books in planning. Yes, three, three, in the, planning. three in the works. But what I love about their work is that they have very concrete, it's not just sort of airy-fairy, well, be balanced. They have really concrete steps to how you can achieve it, where to start. If you've never thought about these things before, what's, your, what's the first step do you, you can take? So um, as a takeaway, just so you know, if you're sitting here listening tonight and wondering, OK, it's, this sounds like something I should start thinking about, just log on and start looking and, and or maybe order the books and start reading. And I promise you, they will guide you there. Um, one of the things that you all talk about is meditation. And we're, we're so, meditation has been key and to all of your practices. And we're really lucky because Malika, who does this all over the world, has offered to lead us in a guided meditation today, mm -hmm. um, which I'm really, really excited about. And um, I invite you to share a little bit about why we're doing it, what, what we're doing. And, okay. um, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Are you guys up for it? Yeah. A little a short guided meditation. <laughs> So we're just, we're just beginning, so it's just going to be a short one, just a couple yeah. minutes or two. But um, we got to start somewhere. So I do want to start with just saying that you know I have learned when I was nine, and I'm 45 now, so I'm literally a lifelong meditator. I am a very irregular meditator. Um, I've gone through years where I meditated regularly and then years where I haven't. Um, in fact, if you go and you learn meditation at the Chopra Center, they'll tell you do half an hour in the morning and do half an hour in the evening. I don't have time to do that and I haven't done that for about 15 to 20 years. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think one of the most important things about meditation is, you know, we're doing it so that we're not as stressed. So please don't get stressed about your meditation <laughs> um, and be self-forgiving. When your meditation program stresses yes. you out. <laughs> so what I do, um, and you know, my mornings are crazy. I have a 15 and a 12 year old and we have to be at the bus by 6.45 and to be honest, I just can't get in my hot water or um, my meditation. But what I love about Kimberly is that every time I hear you and we have we have these wonderful conversations, I'm so inspired to do it again. And um, it, yeah, yes. it, it comes back. But so what I do is I try to find 15 minutes at least once a day. And it usually actually extends to half an hour because it's such my time. Um, but you know, I do it in between two to three, like in between the work and kid time. You know, I'm still in that phase um, of running around and balancing that. So the meditation that I wanted to do today is something that's really simple. 
that you can do anywhere, anytime, any place. It doesn't have to be in a quiet, secluded place. I mean, that's nice when you're in a peaceful area, but you could do this in the busiest airport of the world, <laughs> and you would still be able to find some moment of connection. So there are three aspects to meditation, um, or this field, I would say. There's the mindfulness kind of bucket, which is a better word is awareness. So it's being aware of our thoughts, of our body, um, of what's happening around us. Then there's kind of traditional sound meditation techniques, which use what we call mantras. So a mantra literally translates into man is for mind, and tra is the root for instrument. So a mantra is just a sound that is an instrument of the mind that helps our, our thoughts settle down. And then the third part, which we find in traditions around the world, um, is self-reflection. And so that's a very important part, and it goes back to setting our intentions, knowing who we are. There are many, many health benefits to meditation, which you can read about everywhere now, but ultimately, the this, this, sages and the rishis who were meditating in the caves of the Himalayas or in mm -hmm. Israel, they weren't stressed out. <laughs> they weren't meditating for that. They were meditating to understand who they were and why they were here and what are kind of the mysteries of the universe. So self-reflection is an important part of that. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to ask you, and I'll explain it first, is we're going to sit comfortably. So the first thing is you want to sit comfortably because if you're not comfortable, you'll be distracted about how uncomfortable you are. So, and if you need to move in the meditation, move. I'm going to ask you, I'll first explain it. We'll close our eyes and I'm going to ask you to mentally repeat the words, I am. I am. Now something about these words, it's a mantra. I am is similar to Om, Amen, Amma, Mama, Abraham. There are, we call these primordial sounds. They're healing sounds. So I am Om, the infinite to the finite. I am Aham. So there are many mantras. We'll use I am because it's just universal. And what we'll do is we'll, when, uh, I'll have you close your eyes, and all I want you to do is mentally repeat the words, I am, I am, I am. No particular rhythm or pace. Some of you, it may be really fast. Others, it may be really slow. Don't try to regulate your breath. And what will happen is you'll repeat it three, four, five, seven, eight times. And then your mind's going to wander. And you'll think, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. I'm so hungry. Um, gosh, this is taking forever. And like your mind will just start to wander. Now, that is completely normal and natural in what your mind actually wants to do. So in meditation, we're not trying to empty our mind. We can't empty our mind. All we're doing is by repeating this word, we're breaking a cycle of thoughts, where one thought triggers another thought triggers another thought. We're just introducing a healing sound, I am in between racing thoughts. And so it'll be this natural flow between I am, I am, I am, a thought, a sensation, a feeling, etc. Then you'll notice that your mind's racing. And all I want you to do is when you notice that is to come back to the words I am, I am, I am. And so it's this constant flow between the words and that. And what happens is naturally your breath will slow down. Some of you, even in the two, three minutes, we're going to just be quiet before I ask questions, um, may sit there and think, oh my god, I just can't get my mind to stop, and your mind will be racing. That's OK. In fact, notice how hard it is for you, and that's probably a sign that you need to do this even more. Some of you may fall asleep. <laughs> um, and a lot of people say to me, every time I try to meditate, I fall asleep. Again, notice what your body is telling you. You're really tired. So there's no rocket science here. It's just your body is desperate for rest. And some of you may just kind of slip into these moments of just real kind of quiet and peace. And suddenly, you'll kind of think, oh, that was really restful. That's another thought. As soon as you have that thought, I just want you to go back to the words I am. So we're going to sit quietly and do it just for a few minutes, two to three minutes, just to anchor ourselves and be quiet. 
And then I'm going to add a self-reflection piece. And this is really the piece that my dad you know, used to guide my brother and I in, which is really asking ourselves questions. And sometimes we ask questions and we don't know the answers. But we need to just listen to what bubbles up. Um, and sometimes these questions make people feel uncertain or insecure. Um, sometimes it's very empowering. And so all I ask you to do is just experience the answers and then let them go. OK, so there'll be four questions at the end. All right, so sit comfortably. And we'll just begin. Um, if you're comfortable, um, the reason we close our eyes is just to take away uh, visual distraction. So if you're comfortable, close your eyes. And I'd like you to take a deep breath in and out. And another breath in and out. And now for the next two minutes, I'll time us. I want you to just mentally repeat the words, I am. I am. And when your attention drifts away to thoughts, noises in the environment, physical sensations, just gently come back and prefer the words, I am. I am. Now, keeping your eyes closed, you can stop repeating the words, I am. And with your eyes closed, I want you to take a deep breath in and out. And another breath in and out. Now we'll move to the self-reflection aspect. And I'd like you to still keep your eyes closed. And as I ask these questions, avoid intellectually answering the questions right away. Just experience the answers. Who am I? Who am I? What do I want? What do I want? How can I serve? But we'll begin with, how can I serve myself?
And now, how can I serve? How can I serve my world? Now shift your attention to your heart and we'll just take a moment. I want you to think about what am I grateful for today? What am I grateful for today? So with your eyes still closed, I want you to let go of any sensations, images, feelings, or thoughts that may have arisen. And let's take a deep breath in and out. And one more breath in and out. And whenever you are ready, you can gently open your eyes. So, yeah, it's a very simple meditation. Um, and you don't need to ask yourself the questions every meditation, um, but ask them every few months. Um, but really, it's a very simple meditation. I do it in carpool line all the time. <laughs> <laughs> sit anywhere, close your eyes, take a few minutes and just take a few breaths and use the mantra, I am. Um, and you can find that even in, you know, we did that for two minutes, you can settle down. Take mm. that time for yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, if we don't take time for ourselves, we cannot look after anybody else. That's a really important mm -hmm. message for mothers too. Right. I, you know, just over the last year, I learned how important self-care is. That is the first thing to go, but. You can do it. If we all sat in here for two minutes and didn't check our cell phones, we can all do this every yes. day. You can do it. I could ask you ladies questions all night long, but I want to open the floor before we go to make sure that um, everyone gets a chance to, to ask questions of you guys. So I will open it to you. Um, as always, it's a conversation. So we want to hear from you guys too. Would anyone like to ask a question? Is it? Okay. So I have been uh, listening to your father for the past year, and he's changed my life because oh, I follow him on Twitter and I do all these wonderful things, and I've been reading his books. And meditating has really helped to calm my mind the past year with kids and family and life changes. My question is this. Um, Sometimes, even during meditation, I feel a rush of anxiety come into, just fills my mind where I can't stop thinking. And the more I try to um, calm myself, the, the, less it's, the less effective it is. Is there anything that, should I just allow that anxiety to come, just, just to take over me? And then how should I deal with that? So yes, so what happens in meditation is, you know, we settle our mind and a natural part of what happens is we start to release stress. And so we may release it kind of physically, you may need to move or like thoughts come or suddenly you'll have this like memory of something when you were seven or, you know, and so that is part of the stress release. But when it becomes uncomfortable, take a deep breath and maybe come out of it. There's no need to like just kind of engage in that actually because if it's not comfortable, um, and I, I do it slowly. You know, sometimes again, it's about self-forgiving as well. And sometimes we take small steps to take the bigger steps. And so it's okay. Don't force yourself. I'm a big believer in don't force yourself. If it's uncomfortable, take a deep breath. Maybe come out of the meditation, and next time, you know, see if it's more comfortable. Um, so I don't know if you have other advice based on your experience. 
Yes, I feel like resisting actually creates more of a block. So like Malik is saying, you can come out or you could try sitting with it for a little while. I think that, you know, for me, when I started meditating like 10 years ago, I could hardly sit for a couple of minutes. I, you know, in Shavasana, the end of your yoga, your yoga practice, you sit there. I would be that person looking at the clock and saying, how long do I have to sit here? This is so uncomfortable. <laughs> and it would be torture. It was not relaxing. But it's a practice. That's why we call it a meditation practice. So I sat with it and sat with it. And five minutes became 10 minutes. And you know, now much longer when I can. So you know, it's, it, it is a practice. There is a, a learning, a, a letting go. But you know, with compassion, we say, if it's really difficult, then I don't think fighting against it helps. I think small get easier. steps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do everything at the same time. But small <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And I found too sometimes that you know go for a walk. Like do sometimes you have to move the body more. And this is Anne, my friend. She's a, a lifestyle coach, and that's been an ongoing thing in the work that I've done with her over the years that we've had this conversation of, okay, sometimes sitting there is so much resistance. So what do you need to do then to work through it? So go on a mindful walk where you're not on your phone or you're not listening to something, and maybe you're still saying a mantra or just being mindful of what's coming up, but you're, you're tiring out some of that anxiety as well. So I think sometimes you have to switch it up. Yeah, and also it's okay to cry or you know, to let the emotion, because that's release. But if it's uncomfortable and really like rushes of anxiety and you can physically feel it, like, you know what? Maybe right now take a deep breath and do something yeah. else. You know, we define yoga in the West. Sometimes we think yoga is just the physical asanas, but really that's such a tiny part of what yoga is. It's really to help prepare the body for sitting, as Samantha was saying. So, I, you know, I practice Kriya Yoga, which is the technique by Paramahansa Yogananda, and there is a physical part, and it does help release so you can sit. So you could try, you know, like Samantha said, doing a walk or doing some kind of physical movement to get that out. We hold so much in our bodies. And hopefully that helps as well. I saw another question over here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we'll, we'll give you a mic right there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wonder how could we like live the life or ignore the judgment from others or how we reduce the judgment like we to ourselves. Like when I wake up every morning I look at the mirror, I can't judge myself, like is my hair look nice or like is my makeup okay or like too much? Like how can we do that? Loving ourselves, being kinder to ourselves. I'll start because I think, uh, and I'm sure you both have better answers, but I'm going to tell you something that my dad used to make my brother and I do when we were young kids. Mm -hmm. It was a game, part of the guinea pig experiment, <laughs> um, where he would have us go for a day, but I'm going to suggest you try it for an hour, <laughs> where um, you don't criticize, condemn, or complain. We used to call it the three C's. And he would challenge us not to criticize, condemn, or complain, either using our you know, words with each other, or when we noticed in our head we became self-critical, um, he would say, shift it. And so what you notice is, and again, take it in small steps, but this is also how our brains work. You know, if we repeat the same thing, you know, then those pathways become stronger. So sometimes we need to just kind of start shifting and noticing 
how our internal dialogue is racing, and your internal dialogue then reflects your external reality. So tomorrow morning, not tonight, um, but tomorrow morning, choose an hour and just try to notice your internal dialogue and when you and your what you say. And when you know, if you notice that you're starting to complain, say, you know what, I'm not going to do that right now, and make kind of some shifts. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I was going to say, you know, if you find that you are judging others a lot, it's because you're judging yourself a lot, right? You know, everything is connected with how we talk to ourselves and how we really view ourselves. For me, coming from such a long period of extreme self-judgment, you know, the thing that was able to break me out was focusing more on the experiential. So what I mean by that is I used to focus on you know, apps and tracking and, and monitoring everything I ate and it was all out here, even though I felt like crap and I didn't have energy. And when I started shifting to you know, a lot of my philosophy, my beauty detox philosophy is a lot about optimizing digestion. When I started freeing up all this energy and I just started feeling so much better, it started to break more and more away from the self Criti you know, it's so easy to just focus on the external. It was just this feeling of like, wow, I just feel good. And you know, when Samantha or Malika was saying, I don't know why I was unhappy, you know, when you start to feel more joyful from the inside out, it really helps to see the truth, which is that you are so beautiful and perfect just as you are. It really is the truth. You have to feel it from yourself and then everybody else is gonna see it and feel it as well. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. I really enjoyed the conversation we had today. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank Beautiful. you. We don't have a lot of time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time because it's going on, but we'll take we'll take one more question and uh, I didn't, I didn't. how about in the back here? So one thing I have trouble with is like personally, like when you first wake up in the morning, like you get you're just like kinda like in one of the I don't know, you don't want to get out of bed, you don't have that motivation. So what are your personal like kind of things that you tell yourself to like get motivated to tell yourself, oh, I can do this today, so. <laughs> what do you do to get yourself going? I also think, you know, I say when I'm, when I'm working with someone's diet or their lifestyle, you know, we talked about the morning routine, but I also look at what's happening the night before. So if you go to bed anxious, you go to bed, you fall asleep watching like Law and Order or some kind of violent show, a lot of that does seep into your consciousness and you can sort of wake up in an agitated state. So we talk a lot about morning and clearing the morning, but I think it is important even if it's two minutes, like Malika said, to settle down. Please, everyone, don't fall asleep watching TV. Have that space where you get recentered. And in the morning, you know, like some days we all have bad days where we don't, we don't want to get out, get up right away, and there's a lot going on in our lives. But we just start to get on a routine. You know, like Samantha was saying, where she broke away from checking her phone right away. And there's research that shows that you know whether it's 21 days or 28 days or some contention about the actual number, when you start to develop a habit, it's like a muscle. It gets stronger and stronger and easier. So you start to create this beautiful morning routine, having time to yourself, maybe getting up 15 minutes earlier. Not all the time. Right? <laughs> Have your hot water with lemon. And it becomes, for yourself, this little ritual to look forward to. So I know it's not easy. You know, Every day won't be easy. But as it goes along, it's part of this practice and part of you know, pro progressing. So I was laughing when you asked the question because for me, my motivation is I don't want my daughter to miss her bus because then I have to drive <laughs> from Santa Monica to Hancock Park. So it has to get me out. But I actually, um, I talk in my book about micro intents. So you know, sometimes you ask what's your intent and it's like this light, big thing that I, you know, how I want to serve. But sometimes you just need to think about one thing today that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've started doing this exercise sometimes in some of my meditations. It's like, forget about everything else. Just think about today, what do I want? Or how can I feel connected? And maybe it's today I'm going to call my brother and catch up. 
or today I'm going to go for a walk with a friend. Or So just think of one thing just today that will make you feel healthier, happier, more connected, or of purpose. And that start with that. Mm -hmm. That is such a perfect note that I want to end on. I'm so glad that you just said that, because as we leave, I wanted to say to everyone in the room, um, I hope that after listening to these extraordinary women tonight, if there's one thing that I can ask you all to do as you walk out tonight, or maybe tomorrow morning, not tonight, <laughs> try to think of one thing that you heard tonight, whether it's meditation, whether it's the hot water with lemon. There's so many other wonderful ideas and practices that these ladies had, as I mentioned before. Pick one, just one small change, and try to enact it in your life. And when we come back for our next salon, maybe that's something we can share. But thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for sharing with us. Appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. We appreciate you guys. Thank you.